Welcome to the November webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Trina Ray to our webinar, who shared with us some of the recent findings and past successes of the Voyager missions. Trina is an astronomer and systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she started her career with a bang, working on the Voyager Neptune encounter in August of 1989. So it's been 30 years. Wow, 30 year anniversary now. She's currently the investigation scientist for the ice penetrating radar instrument on NASA's newest flagship mission, the Europa Clipper. Along the way, she's also worked on the Cassini Huygens mission to Saturn uh, for over 20 years, specializing in planning the science timelines for all of the Titan flybys, but also working as the deputy for the science planning and sequencing team. Trina's received numerous rewards, including the NASA Medal of Exceptional Service and the prestigious Bruce Murray Award for Excellence in Education and Public Engagement outside of normal job duties. She does a lot of speaking for NASA, gives a whole lot of talks, and we're absolutely delighted to have her back with us. So please welcome Trina Ray. Okay, I've unmuted. Can you guys hear me now? We can hear you. All right, I have still your like your faces are right in the middle of the screen. Oh, once oh, you once you share. once you share, then uh, we'll go away, or at least uh, we'll pop up into the corner someplace. So. Okay, <laughs> desktop share. Okay, and then we need the PowerPoint. So we have a couple of movies uh, that look like they were going to be a little bit problematic, and when we get to them. I'll sort of hop outside the PowerPoint and play them separately. And if that doesn't work, then you all have homework assignment to go watch the movie to the farthest. Okay, so uh, Brian, I still have your faces sort of right in the middle. Oh no. No, it's okay, I'm sure it's just me. Oh, maybe, what if- Well, hopefully that's not true for the rest of you out there. And, and usually it, it kind of defaults blocking. to move over to the side, so. Yeah, I don't want it to be blocking what people can see. Yeah. So I've sort of moved it off there to the side. Can you okay, see- so we got Dawn, and so uh, some other people out there are saying that it looks just fine. Oh, so, it looks just fine. So we're well, good. All right, well, uh, thank you for inviting me again. I uh, really appreciated it. Uh, all the great feedback I got from uh, coming to, uh, to give you a talk several years ago on Cassini. And when Brian contacted me about doing the second talk, I said, do I have the talk for you? Uh, one of my favorite uh, missions to talk about is the Voyager mission, because that was my very first job uh, working uh, actually at JPL. I started on the Voyager mission, and I started on the, um, working on the general science data team uh, for the Neptune encounter. So that was really, um, that's kind of crazy, right? If that's your first job at JPL and NASA is working on the Voyager mission in the last of its great planetary flybys, it's really, you're starting at a pretty high bar there. It's kind of downhill uh, for a while after that. <laughs> but anyway, um, Voyager's been back in the, in the news recently uh, because of uh, both spacecraft now have exited the solar system, but also because they've done some clever things uh, to extend the life of the spacecraft. And it's a very popular talk, uh, giving a talk about Voyager. And so I, I offered it to, to you folks and snapped it up. So uh, I call this talk Exiting the Solar System a, a Milestone for Mankind um, because I really want to sort of convey uh, the idea that, you know, when the history of this century is written, right, it's uh, the things that are going to be in the history books forever are going to be sort of the, uh, you know, man walks on the moon and last century, and then uh, exiting the solar system is going to be, is really one of those things that happens uh, for the, you know, the first time you exit the solar system, it happens once in the history of a species. And that's really kind of an incredible thing. And the Voyager mission was just incredible. And so um, I hope everyone is convinced by the you could, uh, by the end of this talk, uh, we can have a debate about what are the best missions of all time. And by the end of this talk, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that Voyager is at the top of that list. And then we can talk about what's number two and number three. Uh, we can have a robust debate about that. All right. Okay, forward. No, you're not gonna go forward. Okay, let me try this. No, that. You're killing me. You're killing me, computer. Oh, okay. 
space bar. So the Voyager spacecraft uh, is a pretty substantial spacecraft. Uh, this is me, a picture of me, sort of my height at about 5'5". Five five. Uh, so you can kind of see that it's, you know, sort of two and a half trinas tall and about uh, five trinas uh, side to side. The uh, power for the radio transmitter is 23 watts, and then it has a high gain antenna there. Then remember, we have giant uh, radio receivers here on the Earth that collect these very, very uh, faint signals. And we still get data from the spacecraft every single day. It's uh, powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator off there on the side. Uh, we'll talk about the golden record later, but it's so prominent on this picture, I'd like to point it out. And then we have the, um, the science boom. The science boom has all of the remote sensing instruments. Uh, so this is the cameras, the infrared cameras, the UV camera, the regular cameras. And then uh, there are uh, a space, there are uh, more in situ instruments that are sort of attached uh, to, the, to the spacecraft. And I think it's amusing to point out to folks that there are three computers inside of Voyager, and each one only has 8,000 bytes of memory, 33,000 words, which to, uh, to folks currently in sort of today's computing world, that's, it almost doesn't even make sense. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft were quite large uh, when they first launched, uh, 825 kilograms at launch. Uh, that includes, of course, all of the, uh, the hydrazine in addition to the science payload. Again, the high gain antenna there, pretty big, uh, 3.7 meters in diameter. And uh, we communicate using S-band and X-band. Uh, so those are wavelength regions uh, in the frequency spectrum for how we uh, communicate uh, with the spacecraft. And right now, because it's very, very far away, it's at 160 bits, not bytes, 160 bits uh, per second. So, uh, and actually, uh, the command rate is even lower than that. Oh yes, here it is, the command rate, 16 bits per second uh, for the command rate. And I bet you this is a little bit out of date. I pulled this from an old slide deck I had. I bet you if I look, we might not even be uh, uh, currently doing uh, that, uh, that rate right now. It's probably even less. So the instruments there, as I mentioned, are up on the, the articulating um, deck there. There's a Oh, this is where the cameras are, the ultraviolet, narrow angle, wide angle camera. We also have, so here you can see, here's like the infrared uh, cameras here, and here's a photopolarimeter. That's what, oops, ah, go back. Uh, cosmic ray detector, we're gonna talk a lot about that uh, uh, instrument tonight, so that you can see where it is. We're also gonna talk about the magnetometer, which is out at the end of the magnetometer boom. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the plasma wave antennas. Um, and the uh, P plasma, the PLS instrument, which is right here, and the uh, low energy charge particle, which is right here. So this is really where all the science instruments are on the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, generally, when Voyager is flying, it flies with a high gain antenna pointed to the Earth, and uh, we don't really move from that anymore. We sort of, if ever we're going to do anything, we sort of swing the the high, we swing the magnetometer around to do a cow. Uh, like once every three months or six months or something like that. <clears throat> but mostly these instruments are just pointed in the direction they're pointed in and they're collecting data. Okay, so what is one of the things that makes Voyager special? Uh, one of the things that makes Voyager special is this was one of the first spacecraft, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first uh, to use uh, gravity assist for uh, sort of planning its trajectory. Uh, the invention of this idea with the gravity assist trajectories was, uh, you know, in the, in the 1960s. Uh, remember, we used to do everything with just propulsion, right? We used to just have chemicals on board. We mixed the chemicals. There were little miniature explosions, and that's how we move spacecraft. That's what we did at launch. That's what launch rockets are. And that's how we move spacecraft around the solar system. When uh, a couple of folks had an idea that you could actually fly by a planet, and even though the gravity of that planet would pull you in faster as you got close to the planet, and it would slow you down as you went away. In the meantime, the planet will have moved and rotated a little bit, and you can do this exchange of energy that will push the spacecraft faster, and it will change its orientation, so change the vector, the, the velocity vector. And that turned out to be incredible. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft uh, took wonderful advantage of this, and that it launched in 77, and then it was able to fly by Jupiter in 79, Saturn uh, in the early 80s, 
And then uh, Voyager 2 went on to Uranus in 86 and Neptune in 89. And that lineup where you could do that only happens once every 176 years. So it's, um, it's a tremendous advantage. And when the team realized that that was available to it uh, in, in, the, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, it's one of the things that made Voyager uh, such a spectacular mission concept and worth the investment. So it was, uh, so Voyager is one of the first and only spacecraft to fly by all four uh, outer planets. So I want to draw your attention to text in yellow. Text in yellow is something I've highlighted because I think this is what adds to my, uh, my list of evidence, my ever growing list of evidence as to why Voyager uh, is the greatest mission of all time, the greatest spacecraft of all time. And first and only spacecraft to fly by all four outer planets, Voyager 2. Uh, this image, which was taken uh, soon after launch, uh, has the Earth and the Moon in a single frame. And uh, this was uh, one of the first images of its kind uh, taken uh, by a spacecraft uh, in 1977. So uh, remember when uh, the Apollo missions were on the other side, the moon was huge. And so this uh, was sort of very iconic, this image of uh, the Earth and Moon together, uh, sort of off in the distance. Uh, and it was a great, uh, at the time, it was very uh, well known. It is really true that you can only explore the solar system for the first time once. Uh, Voyager did that. Now that was one of those little movies. I'm sorry if the, uh, if the video doesn't work so well. The other ones are longer. So this one, I'm not gonna step out of the PowerPoint, uh, but this is from the movie, The Farthest. And this was, uh, was recently released maybe a year or two ago. Uh, and it talked uh, all about the Voyager spacecraft and leaving the solar system. And I just love that quote from Larry. Uh, Larry Soderblom is one of our imaging scientists on Voyager. And it's, I think it just capsul encapsulates it perfectly, right? You can only explore the outer solar system for the first time once. And Voyager uh, is, is the spacecraft that did that. All right, when we get to the other videos, there's two of them. They're a little bit longer and I'll go ahead and step out of the PowerPoint. All right. So uh, just in case, I'm gonna go through some of these very quickly. Uh, I think everybody probably on this uh, telecon is very familiar with the system. But just in case you're not, this is uh, Earth and the four uh, outer planets, the two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, one and two there, Saturn with the giant rings, and then Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants uh, there on the right. And this is an image where the sizes of these are to scale. The Voyager mission was launched in 1977, and it did those flybys that I mentioned. And then, of course, it reached the edge of the solar system. Now, it's been a long time since this has happened, and sometimes these dates just rattle on and you don't really have a sense of sort of the breadth and scope of a mission like Voyager. So I went ahead and I translated this into Trina years. So Trina was nine years old when it launched. Star Wars was in theaters and this was Carter's first year in office. So that'll give you some sense of, of the mission and I'll do this a few times as we go through the talk today. Uh, the Neptune flyby, which I already mentioned was my first job. Trina was 22 years old. I was in college. I was hired as an academic part-time to work on the Voyager project, and it was Reagan's last year in office. And that was just the difference between the launch and all the major flybys uh, of the spacecraft of all of the, the planets. Uh, this is a picture that somebody dug up out of an archive. Just I thought it was utterly charming. Uh, this is uh, me at 22, and I, 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 I'm a hoarder. So I still have that dress. It is literally in my closet right now. I could put my hands on it in, in like one minute. Um, so Voyager went to the outer solar system and what did it discover? It, what it discovered was just a series, sort of a series of shocking things, one after the other that just changed our ideas of what the solar system was like and what the universe could be and how extraordinarily different it was than people had even imagined. To, we, we, knew, uh, we knew that Jupiter had an active uh, um, atmosphere, but until you saw that movie of the, of the great red spot swirling, it, was, it, just, it just sort of changed your perception of what was possible uh, in, in the solar system. There was uh, lightning, the first time we detected lightning outside of 
of the Earth. The, all four of these planets have ring systems. They all have magnetospheres. Uh, so you think, oh gosh, the Earth is special. It has a magnetosphere. It's one of the only ones. Well, they all have magnetospheres. Um, lots and lots of moons. Oh my gosh. All the moons uh, of the outer solar system, they're worthy of a talk all on their own because they are so amazing and so different. Such a great diversity among the moons. And things that you never would have thought, you know, Io with active volcanoes, right? Again, what did we think? We thought Earth was the only place that had active volcanoes. You go, to, you go and fly by Jupiter, and here's this little moon of Jupiter that has nine active volcanoes during the flybys, right? So it really changed our ideas of what was possible. And the nice thing about Voyager is it did it over and over again. Uh, and what an incredible mission. Uh, to be on what an incredible mission of discovery and also a sort of a change to our understanding of the solar system. I think I mentioned most of these. Uh, the Great Red Spot, I have a nice movie of that coming up. Um, active atmosphere, first lightning bolts, polar uh, auroras, first detection of lightning other than the Earth, first detection of active volcanoes uh, other than the Earth, and first evidence of a liquid ocean beyond the Earth. Uh, this is a little moon of Jupiter called Europa. And underneath Europa, uh, there's an ocean, and come to find out, it probably has more liquid water than all the oceans on the Earth combined. And then just tremendously diverse satellite group. And then here's that famous movie of the, of the Great Red Spot. Just uh, mind-boggling, right? Game changer, right? It changed our ideas of what was possible. Nobody was thinking uh, oceans bigger with more water than all than the oceans on the earth. Nobody was thinking active volcanoes, more active volcanoes than on the earth. Saturn was, uh, did not disappoint. <coughs> the complex ring system there with just, you know, millions and millions of particles and this elaborate uh, structure in the ring system that's due to very subtle gravitational effects. Uh, you know, uh, also a diversity of, of satellites around Saturn, in particular, uh, Titan, which is a planet-sized uh, moon with a thick atmosphere. So of all the atmospheres in the solar system, there's basically, you know, Venus, and then Titan, and then the Earth, and then Mars is very, very small, right? Those are the four major atmospheres uh, of the solar system, and Titan is number two in that list. But a moon, just a little moon of Saturn that has a thick atmosphere, uh, just really shocking. We knew that it had an atmosphere before we got there, but we didn't realize sort of what was in it and how, um, how thick it was going to be. And very fast winds, both on Saturn and on um, Neptune. Uh, this is the discovery of a moon with a substantial er uh, atmosphere, very early Earth-like, uh, with uh, sort of a prebiotic um, and a cold place, but with a thick atmosphere. So then we come to Uranus. Now remember Uranus has been tipped over, uh, so it's sort of rotating on its side. Uh, the, the, the sort of the whole body, the planetary axis is, is, is tipped over, you know, almost 90 degrees, and then the magnetic field is tipped back about 60 degrees from that. So the magnetic field is, uh, is very twisted uh, in terms of what it's doing. And Uranus has this weird situation where sort of there's, you know, you know, decades of sunlight at the south, uh, and then and the north is in complete darkness. And then there's a decades where it's uh, on both the uh, sort of both hemispheres, and then just tons of time where the north is completely dark and the south is lit. And uh, we also and then all it also had a tremendous diversity of moons. I don't want to spend too much time on on uh, this. Let's go a little bit faster. Neptune. Neptune was incredible. Of course, this was my first job. Uh, you know, Neptune with this incredible blue uh, from the from the methane uh, the, with the great dark spots there. We also have a nice video of that. Uh, not as dramatic as the as the great red spot, but still quite amazing. And then the ring arcs that turned out to be full rings. Um, and also uh, Triton, which is a very large, uh, one of the larger moons uh, in the solar system. And uh, active geysers seen on Triton. Active geysers. So uh, we know now, of course, that there were act there active uh, plumes on Enceladus, but we didn't, we didn't know that at the time. Going back and looking at the Voyager data, you can see a hint of plumes in the, in the Voyager data, but it was really the Cassini spacecraft, the next one, that, that really 
teased out everything that was happening with the um, with the geysers on Enceladus. So when here we are in the last of the great encounters, and you see these active eruptions on Triton, which is just even farther from the sun than all the other things that we've seen before. You you don't expect any activity whatsoever, and it was it was really kind of it was unbelievable, right? It was unbelievable uh, that this had happened. Now, this is one of those movies. It's about a minute. Um, I'm go and show it in hopes that showing it on the uh, on its own will be a little bit better. It might not. The video might be horrible, and if it's horrible, just live with it for a, a minute, and then it'll be done. You should be able to hear the audio just fine, and then um, and then uh, you'll have a homework assignment to go watch the movie The Farthest. So let me hit. Southern Hemisphere of Triton is entirely covered with nitrogen ice. And as we flew past, we were able to look down at what looked at markings on the surface of the polar cap. We were putting together a mosaic of Triton's globe, but we couldn't get things to line up quite right. Some of the dark streaks, two in particular, would not line up. He's like just scratching his head. It's like, I have no idea what's going on here. This guy's one of the world's experts on anything having to do with planets and moons, and he can't figure this out. Um, I said, well, let's put it in a stereo viewer, red and blue glasses, and the images fused into a three-dimensional model and up popped these guys. And I said, holy moly. And so we knew what we had. It was incredible. I remember. These plumes, black geysers spewing out this stuff. The plumes extending out of the surface for like kilometers. We were seeing eruptions on a world which should have been just a frozen cinder. The last place we would have expected to see further dynamics, further eruptions, was at a moon this remote in the solar system. Just because an idea is crazy, it's not necessarily wrong. <laughs> I love that video because uh, I, it really captured what sort of what was happening and the feel of it in the room at the time. It was just, you know, uh, Jim said it right, it's just, here's the smartest people in the world and they just can't figure it out. And then when they did, your jaw just hit the ground. It was, it was just unbelievable. Uh, and it's one of those things, when you go somewhere that you've not been before, you learn things that you did not expect to learn. Uh, really uh, incredible. Um, and so, oops, let me go back into slideshow mode. Hold on a sec, there you go. So uh, I think, I love this quote from Ed Stone because of just exactly that. It's a very exciting mission to be on because what science is about is learning new things about nature. And when you go places, no spacecraft has gone before, you're almost bound to learn something that no one knew. And what a great quote from Ed. It's one of my favorites. I, I love uh, quoting it uh, in Voyager talks. And every second, every second, Voyager's going somewhere uh, that we've never been, even in the flybys, you know, like a month out, like the, when you're taking a picture of Neptune, that's great. But the next picture that comes in, that's, that's now the best picture that's ever been taken of Neptune. And the next one that comes in, that's now the best picture that's ever been taken of Neptune. It was, it was really wild uh, to be part of that for those uh, several months. I've never, I've worked at JPL for 30 years and I've never seen anything uh, like it with that profile and then that level of intensity and excitement. Um, Okay, so we do the big four flybys, and then we have enough power to get us out to 2020. So what has Voyager been doing since then? Well, one thing that it did is it did uh, a look back. It uh, took what we call the portrait of the solar system. Uh, this was a suggestion uh, from uh, folks like Carl Sagan and, and parts of the imaging team. Other parts of the imaging team were, were, were not in favor of it because it was, uh, because they knew the image was not gonna be uh, spectacular, but it was, um, Carl really did have a great idea about what this would mean to humanity, sort of, to look back and see, uh, and to see everybody, you know, to see Neptune and 
Uranus and Saturn and Venus and the Earth, especially the Earth. And this is the second of the videos. Again, the audio should be just fine, but the, um, uh, the, sorry, yeah, the audio should be just fine. The video might get a little bit behind. It lasts about a minute. And uh, where is it, where is it? And so this is a different kind of milestone than the scientific milestones we've had, one that is sim really symbolic. I'm an imaging scientist, so I first realized, oh, this didn't turn out the way we thought it was going to turn out. And my first impulse is to take my hand and wipe away the dust because there was some dust on it. Well, one of the pieces of dust that I wanted to wipe away was the earth. <laughs> but it didn't matter because in the hands of Carl, he turned it into an allegory on the human condition. And the next slide. The Earth in a Sunbeam. In this color picture, you can see that it is in fact less than a pixel. And this is where we live, on a blue dot. On that blue dot, <clears throat> That's where everyone you know, and everyone you ever heard of, and every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. I think this perspective underscores our responsibility to preserve and cherish that blue dot, the only home we have. Southern Hemisphere of Oops. Triton yeah. is entirely Stop. covered with- We've already heard that one. So um, that's the last of the little cuts from that, uh, from that uh, movie. Uh, the movie is called The Farthest. I have some information about it in the backup slides. Uh, it's definitely, I would, I highly recommend it to your attention. I believe it's on Netflix, even as we speak. Okay, so we finished our four flybys. Then we did the uh, portrait of the solar system just before we shut off all the cameras. The cameras were big power consuming instruments. And with the cameras shut off, we were able to take the, um, in situ instruments and allow them to operate for decades in hopes that we would get to the edge of the solar system. At the time in 1990, I remember sitting in meetings uh, where the best theoreticians on the heliosphere said, uh, it'll be about five years until we get to the uh, edge of the solar system. And in 1995, uh, I was at a very similar meeting and it was five years. And then uh, by 2000, when they said five years, uh, nobody uh, really paid attention. <laughs> we said, well, you know what? We're just going to hope the spacecraft lives long enough to just see it when it happens. And then we'll, we'll work out um, the theory of how it's going to work after that. And so this is a different Oops. kind of nope. mind. No, we've already seen that. So uh, remember, Voyager 1 uh, went to, to Jupiter and Saturn, and then it had a very, um, it got diverted to go by Titan. So it left uh, sort of the plane of the solar system after Saturn. Uh, Voyager 2 went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And, and when it went over the top of uh, Neptune to get to Triton. And then so then it's headed down. So Voyager is headed sort of out and up. And Voyager 2 is headed out and down. Both of them roughly headed towards what you might call the front uh, of the, uh, the heliosphere. Now, what is the heliosphere? The heliosphere is. Uh, the area of space where the sun, <clears throat> so the sun is constantly putting out a ton of uh, particles, <coughs> excuse me, you know, uh, electrons, uh, protons, pl you know, plasma, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's pushing that out and it sort of creates a bubble as we move through interstellar space. And that bubble that is defined by where the, the, the sun has cleared out, uh, that's called uh, the heliosphere and the edge of that. Uh, is the heliopause, right? because all of this interstellar material out here is very disorganized. Um, and so as you're plowing into it, sort of like a, you know, like a snow plow, you know, things sort of uh, build up in the front. And then there's a discontinuity here. So that's the heliopause. This is the heliosphere here. Okay. Uh, now, what are we talking about in terms of its size? Uh, so this, I'm, again, for this crowd, I'm gonna go very fast because I'm sure you guys all know this. It's very uh, convenient though to remind people what we're talking about in terms of size. Um, and there's, to get this in your head, you only have to memorize one fact. And that fact is that light goes around the earth seven times in one second. So just take that in, seven times in one second is how fast light is. And so 
uh, you know, minutes to get to, uh, from the sun to the earth is eight. To get out to Saturn uh, is just a little over an hour. To get out to Neptune was four hours and 40 minutes. Uh, Pluto was out there over five hours. And so where are the, where are the Voyager spacecraft uh, when these things happened um, was much, much farther. So we're talking, <clears throat> uh, why don't I have a slide for that right here? I'm supposed to have a slide for that right here. Okay, well, I get, I bet you money that slide's gonna appear later. Um, so we had all this time that the theoreticians were talking to us about when, is, when are we gonna exit the solar system? What are the signs gonna be? What, what are the signs of the apocalypse? And there were three very distinct signs and everyone agreed to them, that there would be a dramatic increase of the high energy cosmic rays that come from outside the solar system. And the CRS instrument, the cosmic ray subsystem would tell us that. There would be a dramatic decrease of the low energy charged particles that are originating from the sun. And the low energy charged particle experiment would tell us that. And there would be a dramatic change in the direction of the magnetic field because it should be very different from the sun. So those are the three signs. Um, so here we are going along, uh, looking at the low energy charged particles. Uh, and then one day they started to dramatically decrease. And oh my gosh, oh, so excited. This was in 2012. And then of course it was like fake. No, not quite. Uh, then about a month later, it happened again. Everybody was really excited, and no. Uh, but then just a few months after that, uh, we had a permanent change where the low energy charge particles uh, dropped to next to nothing. Um, we also, of course, uh, and then that continued. Uh, then we had the increase uh, in the galactic cosmic rays. Here was that first bump, the second bump, and then the permanent. And so I know a lot of people are like, oh, Voyager announced it was going in and out of the solar system a bunch of times, right? Uh, well, part, partially things were happening when, when people were seeing these big dips. Uh, premature announcements were made by some uh, instrument scientists about, um, about exiting the solar system when we'd all agree that you needed dramatic decrease, the dramatic increase, and we needed a change in the magnetic field. Well, what was the magnetic field telling us at that time? Uh, the, the PI of the magnetometer at that time is as well, we're in a magnetic region, unlike anything we've been in before. It's 10 times more intense, uh, but it shows no indication of interstellar space. It's exactly the same magnetic field that we saw before. It's the sun's magnetic field. So uh, we did not have all three signs. And so it was not uh, determined to be an exit uh, of the solar system at that time. We'd all agreed what the signs were, and we didn't have all three. Um, and so people started to put their, their heads together to figure out what to do. And uh, it turns out that uh, we know that the plasma outside is 40 times denser and colder than the inside, right? That's what it should be. And so how could we measure the plasma? Well, the plasma instrument on Voyager 1 was dead. It had been knocked out uh, earlier in the mission. And so what we had to do is we had to wait. And a coronal mass ejection came along. That's a powerful explosion from the sun. And that shock wave hit this, the plasma that was around the Voyager spacecraft, and it caused all of the plasma to jiggle and vibrate. And at that moment, other instruments, like the, 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 the PRA, the, or the radio plasma wave instrument, they could detect the density of the plasma that Voyager was now embedded in. So it was, it was that fortuitous uh, coronal mass ejection that allows us to get that the density is much higher and of course, the Voyager 1 has exited the solar system and was in a new cosmic realm. And then we're like, okay, even though we don't have the magnetic field, we'll go ahead and, and announce it. And that's when Ed got uh, on camera and he announced that we had exited the solar system. Now, note the Voyager 2 plasma instrument is working just fine. So there was quite excitement that Voyager 2, when it exited, uh, would, have, um, would, ha would be able to measure that. Now again, well, this is one of those pieces of evidence for Voyager being the best mission of all time. First active spacecraft, active as in still taking science measurements uh, to enter interstellar space. And that happened in uh, August of 2012. A historic milestone in the greatest journey of exploration that has ever been undertaken by humankind. I love Ed's quotes. I throw them in whenever I can. Okay, um, so where are we in Trina's timeline? Uh, the, uh, Neptune encounter was her first job at JPL, and Reagan was in office. Uh, when Voyager uh, uh, two, ex uh, Voyager one exited the solar system, 
I was working at JPL. I'd been there for 23 years, and it was Obama's third year in office. That's when that happened. So trying to give you a sense of how long some of these things take. Nine years old, 22 years old to 45. Now, as I mentioned, we are very excited about PLS, right? A Voyager 2, uh, because we have a working PLS instrument. And so they made a wonderful graphic for us to use in our outreach presentations. Here's the dramatic decrease in the heliospheric particles combined with a dramatic increase in the galactic solar rays. So that was pretty straightforward. But everybody was really excited to see what the PLS instrument uh, was going to tell us. Um, no, I added this because I really like this. Uh, this shows Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 on top of each other, right? So the red line here is Voyager 1. So here's the red line here. Here was that first dip, second dip, third dip, and down, right? Here's Voyager 1 with the rays, the rays, and then it was up compared to Voyager 2, which had quite a bit smoother transition between one and the other. Uh, and that's great, right? Two data points, much better uh, than one. Now, what did the PLS data? The PLS data was there the whole time. Radio velocity drops to zero. Uh, it showed us that we had a, a normal or tangential velocity that had been diverted. So the, the particles that were behind us were getting pushed. They were going past us and then getting pushed to the side, sort of off to the side. Um, the solar wind begins to act with the interstellar medium. It's pushed out and away, like a wave hitting the side of a cliff. And uh, once we got outside, there was no detectable solar wind. Yeah, way to go, PLS. And so the nice thing about this is everything together shows us that the story of the transition uh, out to interstellar space is one of sort of a turbulent, active space within our sun's influence into the relatively calm waters at the edge of interstellar space. Uh, and so of course now that very complicated, that very simple diagram of how you, of what does the heliosphere looks like is now much more complicated, right? So here you have the Voyager 1 path, Here's the Voyager 2 path. It shows you where, uh, sort of where um, one was up and one was down relative to the, uh, to the ecliptic plane. Here's the interstellar plasma flow that gets diverted around. So you can see there's that region where things are sort of sideways. You're sort of flying through things sideways. Um, it has some nice uh, sort of, you know, how many AUs, uh, that sort of thing, 119 AUs here and 121 AUs. Remember, an AU is an astronomical unit. That's the distance from the Earth to the sun, and it's three, uh, three minutes. So that's, um, that's the light uh, time to those two. Take that number and multiply by three. Okay, so where are we now? Well, where we are now is we've sampled this thing twice, but it was seven years apart. And I think you all know that the, sol the sun has an 11-year cycle of solar cycle. So, uh, you know, that's kind of interesting, right? What was happening, it was only, and both of them are towards the nose, neither of them are towards the tail. So there's now kind of a bit of a controversy, right? Do we think that the heliosphere is round or do we think that the heliosphere is sort of comet shaped? And there's a, a group of scientists sort of on both sides of this. And the structure of this is really gonna be determined, determined by the interstellar magnetic field. And what do we know about the interstellar magnetic field? We know that we're not measuring it yet because we're still measuring the sun's magnetic field. The sun's magnetic field is leaked out into the interstellar medium, and that's what we're measuring. So we don't have a measurement yet of interstellar magnetic field. What if it's really strong? Well, okay, if it's really strong, uh, then um, let's see. If it's really strong, it should be a, a sphere. And if it's weak, it should be a tail. Now, interestingly, uh, Cassini did a very interesting observation when it was in orbit around Saturn. It was taking pictures all the time with its magnetic imager, its MIMI instrument, and finally it put together in sort of a full sky, right? It was, it was always looking at Titan or some other things, but they finally put together a full sky map. And what they noticed was, yeah, there's a difference between sort of the front and the back, but it's not huge, right? It's kind of in family ish so uh there's this is where the team that says or at least part of the team that says hey i bet you it's more round than you think uh is getting some of its data is from uh observations like that but of course uh what we really need to do is we need to sample the pristine magnetic field and so what we need is for voyager one and two to last a little bit longer and to get out 
even further into the interstellar space and measure pristine magnetic field. So that's what we need. We need them to live longer. We thought we just needed them to live until we exited the solar system so we could get those theoreticians in their five years until the edge of the solar system thing nailed down. And now that they've done it, they can rest easy. Wrong, they cannot rest easy. We still need them because just imagine, these are 42 years old, these spacecraft. If we wanted to send a spacecraft to answer this question now, it would take us 42 years or more, to, uh, 42 years-ish, unless we come up with a really fast way to get out there uh, to answer this question. So we need the spacecraft to last longer because the debate can only be settled by direct observations. I love it. Voyager, still, still kicking ass and being relevant. Um, okay, so where are we now? Voyager 2 has now exited the solar system. I was 51 years old and Trump was in his second year. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? The spacecraft are old. We've already turned off everything that we can that made sense. We've turned off all the big power hungry cameras. Uh, we've done everything we can. Uh, so what are we going to do now? Well, so after, you know, sitting down with the team, they decided that what they would do is turn off uh, a heater to an instrument uh, as a test to see if uh, the instrument would continue to give data, even though this is well beyond the operating specs that it had ever been tested in. And because the cosmic ray, the CRS, the, co uh, the uh, cosmic ray instrument, it was determined as that was the one that was the best bet for the money in terms of the amount of wattage, the amount of power that it was using. And, and if we were to lose that instrument, uh, the sort of the least impact. So they decided to turn off the Voyager 2 cosmic ray instrument. And I'm happy to report that they have confirmed the instrument is running just fine. It's dropped to a chilly minus 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And just note that it was only tested uh, over 42 years ago down to minus 49. So how fabulous is that? Uh, also, the spacecraft, as you know, is getting old. Uh, there's a lot of things that, um, that aren't working properly or that are degrading over time. I mean, 42 years is a long time for it to be active. And um, one of the things that is degrading is the thrusters. And this is how we hold attitude. We have uh, little thruster clusters out there that sort of control the attitude and the pointing of the spacecraft so that we can point the high gain antenna very accurately at the Earth. Uh, and occasionally when we need to do that big swing of the mag boom around, it does that as well. So uh, those thrusters were degrading. Uh, we brought back sort of one of the key engineers uh, from, from the early days of Voyager. He'd, he'd moved up the chain and he was an assistant lab director. Uh, but we brought him back, put him on the Voyager payroll and said, okay, Chris, uh, we need you to help you. We need you to help us figure out what to do here. He loved it. Oh my gosh. He loved working on this problem. They brought some of the best propulsion engineers uh, on board and they looked at what were the options. And it turns out that there's a set of uh, trajectory correction maneuver thrusters, almost identical in size and functionality uh, to the attitude control th thrusters. These were used at the planetary flybys uh, when you had to do things, um, the trajectory correction maneuvers of when, you know, you sort of, you're going over the top of Neptune, but you need to get down to, to uh, um, Triton. That's a trajectory correction maneuver. And so these were the thrusters that did that. Um, they have not been on for 37 years on Voyager 1 and 30 years for Voyager 2. And they tried them this year, and both sets work just fine. Uh, so they're going to be able to uh, transition all of the attitude control to those. And so we've added several years of lifetime uh, to, these, uh, to these spacecraft. The power thing is what's going to hit us again. Um, they're going to look at perhaps other heaters. Nothing is as promising as the CR CRS heater. Uh, but at some point, we'll have to start turning off instruments. Um, so then they'll have to decide which instruments get turned off in what order. Okay, uh, mission status as of today. I thought you guys might like to see this. Uh, so I did a screen uh, snapshot today. Uh, 42 years, two months, 13 days. Uh, distance from Earth is 148 AUs, 122 AUs. Velocity, 38,000 miles per hour. And the one-way light time is 20 hours and 17 hours. And this is the cosmic ray data that we've done that. Also, here's the status of the instruments. Uh, you can see that the, all the optical remote sensing instruments are off. The PLS for Voyager 1 is off because it's broken. Uh, Voyager 2 is still operating, and all the in situ instruments are still operating. And finally, the, the record. Now, we didn't talk much about the record. Um, 
I recommend that movie to your attention about the, the, the farthest. It, it talks a lot about the record. Uh, the record is attached to the side of the spacecraft. It has a variety of audio files on it, uh, greetings from the president at the time. It has uh, greetings uh, in 54 languages. Uh, so, so think of it as almost like tweets. They didn't have very long. They only could say a short thing. And so they had about a sentence in about 54 languages that got recorded and put on there. Um, it also has uh, about uh, 100, oh, 118 pictures uh, that got effect digitized. These are instructions here on how to play it. Here's the stylus and how fast you have to, to do um, uh, to spin the record. Uh, this is a map of where we are relative to all the pulsars around us. So hopefully uh, someone would be able to find us. The, the thing about the Voyager record is um, it's sort of it's the profound, um, the profound human story that it contains. Uh, here we are, you know, in the 1970s, and we were building this thing that was going to exit the solar system, and we knew that. We might not be talking to it at the time, but we knew it was going to exit the solar system. And so we put a message on there. And we all knew at the time that the sun is going to, you know, become a red giant and it's going to destroy the earth in 4.6 billion years. But Voyager, Voyager is going to be beyond that. Uh, Voyager is going to not be destroyed by that event. Uh, and so uh, the Pioneer spacecraft, the Voyager spacecraft, both have these records on them. And it's sort of profound to think that this record is going to survive for billions and billions of years in the vacuum of space. There's, there's nothing to degrade it, really. Uh, it's protected. It's, you know, it's behind this. This is, a, this is a lid here to it. It's actually behind that. Um, it will outlive the solar system and the Earth. And it may be the only evidence that we ever existed is the Voyager record. And that's kind of a very profound thought. Um, and again, uh, I put this text in yellow because I think it is one of the things that when we pause for a minute and we think about the Voyager mission, it is one of those profound human stories about this mission that tell it that it is one of the greatest missions uh, of all time. And I'm pretty sure uh, website, voyager.jpl.nasa.gov. Um, I'll leave this screen up so that people could take a screenshot. Let me just check what's next. Right, movie the farthest. Uh, everyone has a homework assignment to go watch that tonight. Uh, yep, and I'll leave this one up. And with that, I will take questions. Oh, Ryan, my. I have no idea how we're going to do questions. You well, I've got the questions right now, and I will moderate these for oh, you. Excellent. So, excellent. so we've we've got this covered. So, and we have a, quite a few questions here, and so okay. we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so, William, a long time ago, asked, "How did the technicians safely handle and assemble the radioactive power supplies?" So, uh, the RTGs are uh, a joint operation between NASA and the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy routinely deals with radioactive material. Uh, and so it was, they were assembled at a nuclear power plant that routinely handles this sort of thing. And they were sent to the Cape separately. We built the whole spacecraft, put all the instruments on it. And then right just before launch, uh, the Department of Energy came in, attached the RTGs, we tested it to make sure it worked, and then we launched it. All right. So Ron asked, um, was it ever considered to have Voyager 1 also fly by Uranus and Neptune. So it was. Uh, that is what the team would have preferred to do. Um, but uh, just due to the nature of how Saturn's system was configured when we got there, and Titan, we, the interest in Titan was so high uh, that there was a huge chunk of the science community that wanted us to make sure that we did Titan well because there was the idea that Titan, Titan could be incredible, right? If you think Io's blows your mind, right? What about Titan? Uh, and so when we got approved to be funded, we were originally the Mariner Jupiter Saturn mission. Uh, we were just gonna go Jupiter Saturn and the top level one objectives, Titan was one of them. And so it was decided that we weren't gonna go on to Uranus and Neptune, although when we built the spacecraft, we knew that was an option. So uh, a lot of people, when they, a lot of the engineers, when they built the spacecraft, built it for the Uranus-Neptune mission. But we were funded for Jupiter and Saturn. And Titan was one of the top objectives. And so uh, Titan had to be done and had to be done well. 
So Voyager 1 got diverted to do a fabulous Titan flyby. But of course, what did they see? They took a thousand pictures of the top of the roof's clouds, right? It was an orange. And so it was, was realized that we didn't have the right instrumentation for a Titan mission. And so uh, Voyager 2 was going to be diverted to do a Titan flyby if Voyager 1 had not been successful. But Voyager 1 was successful. We were going to learn nothing new by Voyager 2 being diverted to do a Titan flyby. So Voyager 2 went off to do Uranus and Neptune. All right. So those orbital mechanics kind of get in the way of doing everything that you'd like yes, to do. Yes, Titan was around on the other side and down. Yeah. So it was one of those things. Which uh, kind of uh, leads into this next question that Manuel asked about uh, Pluto. And so we had to wait around for just a few years ago for New Horizons to go there. And so what was the configuration at the time? Why, why not try to go to Pluto? Uh, Pluto was on the, absolutely the wrong side of the solar system for Voyager. Uh, Pluto at the time was off in the, uh, uh, not quite in the magneto tail, it was coming around, but it wasn't on the, it wasn't on the right side, so we could not see it. it. There was no chance that we could get to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uh, when the New Horizons mission actually finally did go to Pluto, they also did not go Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, right? They just went Jupiter, uh, I'm pretty sure Jupiter and then straight to Pluto. Just let me think for a minute. I know they did a Jupiter flyby. Yeah, Jupiter and then straight to Pluto. They got a big gravity assist from Jupiter and then to Pluto. Yeah, I seem to remember that there were some pretty spectacular images of uh, Jupiter when it went by. Yeah. Then, so that was pretty Yeah, because a whole new, right? Like all new cameras, right? A new frontier. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I mean, it's like 20 years later in terms of the technology of the cameras that you could bring and the infrared that you can do and spectacular, right? So that kind of uh, brings up kind of a, a, a question, you know, having to do with the, with the cameras. And so, you know, we did turn the camera around when the last acts was to, to, you know, take the family portrait, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And if there was enough power and if the cameras were still working, uh, any idea of what might be seen if they were turned back around, what would they see? So, uh, so first of all, uh, let's take a look at your two ifs. Uh, if there was enough power, there is not. Uh, if the camera was still working, it's not. We took all the software that controlled the camera and deleted it from our very precious 33,000 words of memory. Uh, so we don't even have the software on board the spacecraft to control the cameras anymore. Uh, but if you were to turn on, um, it, what would the, you, it would be even uh, less dramatic than the, than the portrait that you currently have. The sun would be even smaller and fainter and I'm not even sure you could see any of the planets anymore if you were to do a, um, a, a, a portrait again. Okay. And remember, remember light falls off as one over R squared. So at the time we were what? We were 30, 40 AU out and now we're 120 AU out. So I mean, even the sun is gonna be just a few pixels across. In fact, now that I think about it, there's no way you'd be able to see the planets. Even the sun is gonna be just a few pixels. Even those um, outer big planets would be right, yeah. way smaller even than this yeah. place. So, so John wonders, uh, could a mission like this be done again with uh, the more modern technology without having to wait for the next uh, gravity assist opportunity? Um, well, not a mission like this, right? Uh, you, because if you were trying to get to all four of those planets, uh, it's very hard. But what you could do is you could send missions. Uh, Voyager did something very smart, which we used to do all the time. Pioneer, we had Pioneer 10 and 11. Mer, we had Mer 1 and 2. Voyager, we had Voyager 1 and 2. We always used to build two. Um, what you could do is you could build two identical spacecraft and send them sort of on a Jupiter Uranus and Jupiter Neptune, right? You could send them to the outer uh, giants, uh, the gas giant planets. But you wouldn't be able to do a Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, again. Just the uh, solar system is not configured properly. And I guess that even with New Horizons, you know, it went by Jupiter to get the gravity assist, but mm -hmm. there wasn't anything else that it could have gone by uh, on its way to Pluto. And, and that right. actually was a really fast mission. It was, it on was a, a very direct shockingly fast. fast how fast it got out there. It was amazing. Yeah. And now it's gone by, um, they renamed it. It's not Ultima Thule anymore. It's um, Arakoth or something yes, yes, yes. like that. Yes, so. yes. 
And and now they're kind of looking, right? Is there another little, uh, there's another little thing out there maybe they can go buy, so that's nice. And that uh, is a question. Blaine wonders, is there anything out there um, that Voyager might go by? You know, what, what possibly could it uh, go by? You know, probably nothing within the, the solar system, obviously, but uh, uh, anything else in its potential path? So the navigators have done their due diligence and they've looked at this. And it turns out that in about 400,000 years, uh, it's going to go by a star, pretty close. Uh, I forgot exactly the name of this star. Uh, you could look it up on the internet, uh, but that's about it. Um, it's, uh, there's really nothing uh, that Voyager could go by, sadly. But remember, Voyager, right, had all of these instruments that were, were great for the flybys, but then we took all that power for those instruments and put them into the, into the remote sensing instruments so that they would last for five years, uh, 10, and now it turned out that we needed them to last for, for 30 years, right, uh, to get to the edge of the solar system. And so that is, that is void. So if you think about it, Voyager's next target was the edge of the solar system. And all we had to do was make sure it lived long enough to get there. And it did. Now, Voyager's next target is this stinking, pristine magnetic field, right? We need to get out of this area where the sun's magnetic field dominates. So those are its targets. It's a little bit different. It's not a body so much as a, a distance. Yeah. Okay, we'll go for the last question here. And I apologize sure. to those of you who have asked some questions that we're not getting to. We have some really good ones here. So Ron uh, asks, and, and taking you back to the design table, um, kind of looking back, knowing what we know now, is there any instrument on Voyager that you would have added or changed? What would you do different today? Well, so that's a very difficult question because what we would do different today is because we have the capability of putting, I mean, like, a, for example, an, a mass specs uh, to, to sniff, right? I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing instrument. But we didn't have, you know, we put the best instruments on that we could have. Uh, the, I don't think there was any instrument that was left on the cutting room floor uh, that people uh, whinged about later, right? They, they, there was really a break. There was, these were the 10 instruments that mattered and, and, uh, and those are the ones that got on. I can't really think of anything because my brain of course is polluted with current instruments. Um, back to 1977. No, you know, I never heard anybody say, gosh, remember, gosh, if only we'd had that blah bitty blah gamma ray spectrometer, whatever, boy, we would have been able to answer this. I never, I don't remember anybody ever saying that. So I, I think we did a pretty good job. And certainly it's returned a lot of really oh. excellent science. And Unbelievable. Science. Unbelievable. Voyager's just been incredible. Well, you've convinced me. I think that, uh, you know, I... I am not going to doubt you when you say that it's the, the best, best mission. Of all time. So I, I, I think that uh, you definitely have hit it as the number one. So. And of course, Cassini would have to be number two. That's uh, your uh, second favorite because you've worked on that for such a long time. I, I think you can make an argument for Cassini being number two. Uh, yeah. Some people could, I think, reasonably make an argument for Viking, uh, the first you know, two orbiters, two landers on Mars. Um, that would be a robust discussion. Uh, and I think you could have that discussion. In no way is it Mer. No. Or Galileo. No. So <laughs> uh, there's a big break. And just look at one simple way to look at it is the number of publications that came, right? Oh, gosh, yes. And they're still coming. Right. So, for example, Cassini's sitting at 4,000 and still coming, I think. I don't remember for Galileo. Uh, it's surely it's in around a thousand. Uh, MERS around a thousand. Um, actually, Viking didn't have that many publications, but boy, they were big ones. I'll have to look at the. I don't remember how many Viking, but you could make an argument, I think, for Viking. But yeah, I, I would put Cassini as number two, and yeah. then Viking as number three. All right. Well, that's all for tonight, and so thank you very much, Trina, for joining us this evening, and thank you everyone oh, for okay. tuning in. So you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We'll post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel 
in the next few days.